it's it's recognizable. Everybody within the tribe knows what a neopod is. If even if they don't know exactly like how to fish them or how they were fished or who made them or or how to make them, they all recognize what a neopod is. It's a symbol of our persistence on the landscape. Um, it's something that that brought us through hard times, but it's also something we were able to carry from our ancestors right on up until today. Um, so in many ways, I think we've used it to sort of, to exist, you know? And not only does it provide food, but it, it maintains our culture. Like it sustains us, you know, in a more of a spiritual sense. You know, we've resisted colonialism with it. We've resisted sort of the whole modern world with this eel pot. Um, while we still live in the 21st century, there are all these echoes of the past in the Potomac community, and this is one of them. Um, and it's a very important one because of what it says about us. I'm Brad Hatch, uh, member of the Potomac Indian Tribe in Stafford County, Virginia. Um, and I am part of the Virginia Folklife Master Apprentice Program. I'm a master hill pot maker. Potomac Indians are one of 11 state-recognized tribes in Virginia. We have a lot of history dating to the first decades of English colonization here in Virginia. Uh, John Smith encountered us in 1608 when he uh, did his explorations up the rivers. We were here uh, and show up pretty heavily in the records all the way up into the 1660s. Um, in 1666, the Virginia Council has an act that kind of declares war on the Potomac Indians and other northern tribes. We persist as a community because we kind of adapt to that new colonial landscape. Um, we start living with English families, but we kind of stay in the same general area of Potomac Creek um, and what we call today White Oak, sort of the White Oak region. The split oak eel pots were fished with for a long time, but starting in like the 1980s and 90s, there were laws passed in Virginia and Maryland that kind of more or less outlawed split oak pots because it required mesh sizes for eel pots so that little eels can get out. And so when you do that, you can't weave an oak pot because they're, they're woven tight, nothing can get out of it. So there really weren't that many people making them anymore by the time you get to like the 2000s, like late 2000s period. There were two people in the tribe that went to revitalize it, Mickey Sheneman and D.P. Newton. I asked him, I said, can you show me how to make these things? And he said he would. So uh, he taught me how to make the pots, went out, cut a tree, and split it down and everything, and, and made a pot together. Um, and then I started making a second pot. And when I was partway through making my second pot, DP passed away. And so at that point, I thought, my God, I was the only person left who knew how to do this. Um, I'm Reagan Anderson. Um, my background, I guess, a little bit. Um, I have a degree in historic preservation centered mainly on archaeology, so this is not too different. Um, Brad and I are pretty close as cousins, and, you know, we do a lot of stuff together, and I thought that it would be a good idea because I have family members that didn't make the pots, but they fished with the pots. It's always been in my family. Nobody's ever picked up making them or using them or anything like that, so I wanted to be part of that tradition and to keep it going because I don't want Brad to be the only person to remember it, you know, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so I'm David Happy Longs the Fourth. I've grown up in the Fredericksburg and Stafford area. The church kind of led me to get more in depth with the tribe, even though I've always been a part of it through my childhood. I met Brad through the tribe and we started working on like bark baskets, eel pots, turkey calls out of turkey bones, that type of thing. And that led into me actually learning, helping out with his first eel pot class. And then when I had this opportunity, I took it because I thought it'd be fun and interesting, and I was right. So I name all of my pots because that's just me. Um, this is Terry. That's it. She is my first pot. She's completely finished. So this is what they look like when they're completely done with their cork. But then this is the one I just finished today, a full-sized eel pot. She's not completely finished. Um, but her name is Virginia, because she'll be going to the Department of Historic Resources to be in their collection for our tribe. Yeah, gotta think of more names. You know, when I make them, I feel like, uh, it's almost like you can know 
all the people that came before you in in a way. Um, you may have never met them, you may have only heard their names, and there are some people you'll never know their names, but you share a practice with them. I think of my great-grandmother who made them, because she, she died shortly after I was born, but I've always heard about how she made these. So when I make them, I think about her and how she would have been making them at my grand, great grandfather's house. So she's who I connect with through them. Oral tradition is a very important part of Virginia tribal communities. Um, and I think that process of making eel pots and, and just crafting and learning a craft in general um, is something that really helps carry oral traditions along. You know, we sit around and make these pots and we, we don't just make them in silence, but we may have seen that way today. But most of the time, you know, we talk and talk about stuff that happened back in the day or, you know, it's an important way to be able to carry those oral traditions along. Any way that the community and members of the community can kind of meet up and interact with each other, um, all kind of help that sort of thing. In terms of like sharing the knowledge of this and reaching out to the younger, newer audience, a good important first step for that is how our tribe is seeking out federal recognition because that would give us a much larger scale to share our knowledge on and open up a lot more opportunities for us with younger generations instead of keeping us enclosed in the area like only having state recognition would. There's objects I think that say a whole lot more about a group of people than any historic document ever could. I think these are one of those things. I think they have a real story to tell about our people and about sort of where we've been, where we're going. So I think that the eel pot itself as an object um, is just a very important thing to our tribe and the story it can tell.